get started. My name is David Meyer, and I'm the dean uh, here at Tulane Law School. And I just wanted to uh, inject myself very briefly in the program just to uh, welcome you to the law school. Uh, it's really an honor for uh, for Tulane Law School to uh, to help host this uh, gathering, uh, along with uh, both the Friedrich Ebert Foundation uh, and the uh, Southern Poverty uh, Law Center. I think I wanted to put a little context around why we're doing this. The, 15 years ago, the Southern Poverty Law Center and the FES joined forces to annually bring together experts from Europe, from uh, the United States and Canada to discuss right-wing extremism. Um, Over the uh, years, um, I believe much has changed. about the situation in the United States. The uh, title of this panel is about the continuous mainstreaming of right-wing extremism. And I think you know, many folks woke up in November of 2016 and, and were in shock in the United States with Trump's election. But the truth is, is this has been a phenomenon that's been a bit of a while coming. It didn't really actually come out of nowhere. Still shocking, regardless. Um, but you know, we one of the things we do at the Southern Poverty Law Center is we track hate groups. So we do this count every year, and we look at how many neo-Nazi uh, organizations there are, how many Klansmen, how many anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and so on. There's various categories. And we have essentially been seeing a rise in the number of those organizations since the year 2000. It hasn't been steadily up, but there's basically been um, a 40, 50 percent rise in those kinds of organizations in the United States in that time period. So although Donald Trump looked like a big shock, the truth of the matter is that we've been having a backlash of white supremacy in this country for some time. And the year 2000 uh, was important. There was a reason for why this rise happened. That's the first time ever that the U.S. Census came out and said in the near future, at that time it was 2042, white people in the United States will be a minority. In other words, there'll be no majority population in the United States. And obviously, if you're a white supremacist, this is a serious problem, right? Because it means that your political power is inevitably going to be diminished. So that trend and, and a rise of extremism in general in the United States really started sometime around that time. You add to that the economic crisis, the election of the first black president with Obama, and these are all things that have fueled racial resentment, fears over cultural change in the United States, and they're at least part of an explanatory factor for how we found ourselves where we are today, which is Donald Trump in the White House, who obviously has played on racial resentments from the first day that he uh, began to run for office when he talked about uh, Mus uh, Mexicans being rapists, and then, you know, basically race baited his way through the whole campaign, tweeted, you know, Nazi material. Uh, he certainly played footsie with organized racists and sometimes seemed to openly embrace them. He was terrible on the Muslim issue. But he is also actually just the latest in a string of increasingly extremist candidates who have been running for office across the country or have been running in mainstream uh, positions but with more and more extreme policies. So I think a lot of people don't realize that in 2012, um, when Mitt Romney represented the GOP in the United States, there were some very extreme planks in the Republican Party's manifesto that year. Anti-immigrant planks that were written by a guy named Chris Kobach, who's one of the biggest anti-immigrant crusaders in the United States. He's uh, now running for uh, governor in Kansas. He's their secretary of state. There was a plank in uh, the Republican platform that uh, talked about the fact that there was a UN plot going on to impose these crazy ecological laws on the United States, and they would reject it. It's, uh, you don't need to know the details because they're ridiculous, but it's uh, Agenda 21 is what it's called. So 
slowly over the last you know 10 or 15 years we have been seeing more extreme positions get inter entered into the mainstream and donald trump in many ways is the culmination of this trend i often tell um reporters who are asking me sort of how is this possible how did this come to be how did we end up where we are that in 2006 there was a man named george allen who was running for senate uh, on the republican ticket in virginia and he went to a campaign rally and he used the word macaca to describe black people it's obviously an offensive term a racist term and he was out of the race a week later um, it was an unacceptable for a candidate for high office uh, in the party, any party at that time, to engage in that kind of language. And here we sit, you know, 12 years later, and that is no longer the deal. I mean, that is not the world that we're living in. You can now say the equivalent of that word and get elected to the presidency of the United States. We also have right now candidates. We've got a neo-Nazi running uh, on the Republican ticket in, you know, the, in Chicago and Illinois. A guy who was challenging for Paul Ryan's um, seat is basically a Nazi, um, rabid anti-Semite. And there are candidates like this popping up all over um, the United States. And perhaps even worse, the um, sort of emboldened white supremacy, the, the Donald Trump phenomenon, has brought the, the worst thing possible to happen besides our social mores sort of collapsing around race and, and anti-Semitism and other issues, which is that we now have political policies that are happening, are in place, or maybe being challenged in the courts that come directly from the radical <coughs> right. So for example, this idea that we should build a wall, right, that Trump's on and on about, build a wall in Mexico, th that's an idea that David Duke was popularizing, you know, the Klansman who was from this, who's from this area. Uh, back in the 1970s. The Muslim ban um, that is now sitting in the hands of the Supreme Court, I guess the third version of it, was an idea that came from the anti-Muslim hate movement in the United States. The DHS and ICE crackdowns that are occurring and policies that are happening in immigration, these are ideas that were bandied about by anti-immigrant hate groups in, in the last couple decades. In other words, these people were pushing and pushing and pushing their ideas. They started getting some traction uh, in the Republican Party recently. And now they have a candidate in the presidency who's making those ideas a uh, reality. And so although, you know, what the Southern Poverty Law Center warns about a lot are neo-Nazi extremists, domestic terrorism from white supremacists, those kinds of things, hate crimes, what, um, what is really concerning are these policy changes that are affecting millions of people. That's the devastating um, uh, result of Donald Trump's presidency. And also the fact that he's essentially abandoned the cause of civil rights. I mean, that is no longer something that our administration uh, is interested in. So hate has gone mainstream, it's gotten to the White House, and it's deciding the kinds of policies that we have in the United States. It's obviously also a phenomenon that's um, uh, increasing all across the Western world, and I will let my colleagues uh, discuss that. Something about Poland. Poland is an interesting case study of paradoxes. Uh, Poland was once the most multicultural, most diverse culturally, ethnically, religiously country, society in the whole of Europe. In fact, for hundreds of centuries, um, it was the most diverse uh, country of the continent. Today, paradoxically, in contrast, it is the most homogeneous uh, country in the whole of Europe the most mono-ethnic, mono-religious, Roman Catholic. Um, the percentage of minorities is actually the smallest among all of the European countries. That is, that is one important paradox of Polish history. Of course, um, uh, what, What was the reason for, for this contrast is historical events, very tragic historical events, um, namely the Holocaust, um, ethnic cleansing during and after World War II, deportations, changes of borders, 
So Poland today, uh, in a way, is a very different country um, to what it uh, had been. Uh, but still, it, 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 it has a, a special place in, in universal history, and especially in the Jewish history. Um, um, one other reason uh, for the rather special place of, of Poland in universal history is the solidarity movement uh, uh, that uh, rose in, uh, in the 1980s. Um, I don't know how many of you could actually uh, give uh, the number of members of Solidarity at its peak in 1981. Anybody? Somebody said one million, that's a very big number. It was actually 10 million. 10 million members um, uh, of a trade union that was simultaneously uh, a human rights movement uh, in a country of uh, 38 million people. So that makes it one of the biggest human rights movements or one of the biggest social movements in, in all of human history. Uh, led by Lech Wałęsa, um, uh, uh, who later received the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize as a symbol of, 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 of the movement. Since 1989, um, Poland uh, uh, has often been refer referred to as a model of democratic transformation as a, as a model of a transition to, to market economy, as a, as a model uh, uh, um, of the construction of a constitutional democracy, a model uh, um, that was showcased as an example to other nations in, in the region of Eastern Europe uh, and beyond. I actually attended uh, a meeting in, 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 in the Polish President's Palace uh, in 2011 when this person praised Poland for all those achievements and uh, for, <laughs> for good reasons. Uh, um, and something very, uh, very dramatic uh, has happened more recently, uh, a very dramatic turn of events <coughs> since um, 2015 or to be more precisely, since the autumn of uh, 2015, when we had the uh, presidential election, later the, the parliamentary election, a very sharp change of uh, political direction uh, uh, took place in Poland. Um, a new government uh, um, of the uh, currently ruling party, Law and Justice, um, has taken a turn in a very different direction. Um, in a direction of um, authoritarianism, uh, in the direction of nationalist populism. This radical turn happened in, in a large measure in connection with the European refugee crisis. Uh, despite very, very few of those refugees actually went to Poland, there were also um, other reasons um, for the nationalist surge, uh, the, the conspiracy uh, movement uh, uh, around the, 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 the tragic uh, air crash in, in, in Smolensk uh, in 2010 uh, that, that killed the then Polish president and, and many other people. There were many other reasons for, um, for this rapid uh, uh, political change in, in Poland in 2015, but that change has been very profound, going beyond the usual uh, 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 change of uh, political colors of, uh, of, a, of a certain government. Uh, what we have witnessed since then um, um, includes, uh, well, uh, very, uh, very clear uh, disregard for the principles of the rule of law, principles of constitutional democracy, um, a, a, a very uh, broad-ranging crisis of, of, of democratic values on, on, on many different levels, and especially on the level um, of um, official uh, propaganda of hostility uh, to minorities, uh, especially well, minorities such as such as gay people, for example, uh, but also groups such as uh, refugees and migrants, especially Muslims, who have been vilified by mainstream uh, government figures and by the uh, state-owned media 
which are now directly controlled by, by the government and by the ruling party. But what has been, what has been new, uh, what, what happened uh, just this year, uh, since January this year, is a very spectacular, um, um, a very nasty wave of um, um, anti-Semitic uh, sentiment uh, across Polish mainstream media, especially the state-owned, state-controlled media, uh, and, uh, and, and Polish politics. Um, in uh, January this year, on the eve of the day of the liberation of Auschwitz, um, so the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, a piece of legislation was passed by Polish parliament uh, that prohibits criticism um, of Polish responsibility or co-responsibility uh, for the crimes of the Nazi Reich. Um, or uh, any other crimes against uh, humanity, war crimes, or crimes against peace. Um, uh, this wording of, of this particular piece of legislation is very problematic, and it basically amounts to an imposition of an ethno-nationalist uh, history narrative, which of course has serious implications uh, uh, for the freedom of speech. But what I think has been way more problematic even more dangerous than this particular um, uh, law is the kind of discourse uh, that accompanies it. Um, like I said, across uh, uh, Polish media and, and, and politics, uh, a discourse that invokes um, anti-Semitic prejudice and anti-Semitic uh, stereotypes on a scale uh, that is unprecedented in um, uh, in recent decades uh, in, uh, in modern Europe. Um, uh, what I just uh, um, mentioned also uh, fuels uh, legitimization of the, of the extreme right, of the fascist groups uh, that clearly um, feel empowered in the current social and political climate. And there is no better illustration of, of, of that tendency than the annual marches of the far right organized on the Polish Independence Day on the 11th of November in the last years. You may have heard about those marches, especially the one last November, which uh, brought together um, around 60,000 participants. It is organized by the ONR, the National Radical Camp, which is a group that uh, um, has the same name as the original fascist gr group uh, created in Poland, uh, founded in 1934. Um, so the, uh, the continuity of the, of the fascist tradition is very, is very clear in, in, in this case. But by now, it is, uh, it is much more than uh, just a Polish event. In fact, members of extreme groups from, uh, from um, other countries uh, also attended uh, from all over Europe and, um, and beyond. You may be interested to, uh, to learn that an American activist, well known here, I suppose, Richard Spencer, was planning on going to this event in Poland. He, he didn't go eventually, uh, 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 but the very um, uh, intention was, uh, well, was significant. It was not accidental. I had the pleasure to uh, uh, mm, discuss this with the mayor of Charlottesville uh, er earlier this year, and we compared our marches. And, and well, uh, he said, well, we have this big problem because we had a far right march with several thousand people and I said we had 60,000. Um, so we have a slightly bigger problem uh, but obviously there are similarities between, between those marches if you, if you watch uh, the, the, uh, the available uh, footage and, and I believe there is actually uh, some inspiration uh, between extremists on, on both sides of, um, of the ocean uh, uh, in, including including uh, including Poland. Okay, uh, to cut a longer story short, um, what I think the Polish experience uh, tells us is that democratic culture cannot be taken for granted. It is something that has to be sustained um, and something that requires effort, daily effort. 
Um, but I also want to mention that the fight is not over. Uh, I, I, I don't believe it is, uh, it is completely lost yet in, in our case. And I think the activity of our organization, Never Again, is one example of, of this ongoing fight. Um, activity in, in, in the field of education, including informal education. And I just wanted to mention one, um, one initiative uh, of which I am especially proud. It is our participation for more than 20 years now in, in, a, in a big music festival uh, on the Polish-German border uh, that is known as Polish Woodstock. And every year we, we, we are there uh, interacting with, uh, with, with, with young people, and uh, each year there is around half a million people. It is actually the biggest festival in Europe. Um, we organize an anti-racism soccer tournament, and there is, there is a lot of you know, positive energy in Poland still uh, that, that has to be mentioned. If you happen to be in Europe um, in the last days of July, you are very welcome to join us for the, for the Woodstock uh, Festival. Um, Solidarity, I mentioned it uh, uh, in the context of the, of, of the movement of the trade union uh, uh, that, that, that was started in the 80s. But I want to, to, to mention solidarity um, with a small s. I think today it is, uh, it is a value um, that is sometimes forgotten, uh, that is uh, especially precious in, in such challenging times. Thank you. Uh, those of you that heard Michael Chogala's introduction um, have already gotten a sense how, of how shocked uh, the German people, the majority of German people are, that uh, given our history and given the way uh, how we have tried to deal with our history, that now we have about 100 uh, members of parliament um, in the federal parliament that come from a right-wing populist party where um, among conservatives and nationalists, you have quite a few of uh, very questionable characters that can be very well described as right-wing extremists. And that same party, the AFD, Alternative for Germany, is represented in 14 of the 16 state parliaments uh, with uh, percentages up to uh, 25 uh, percent in some of those parliaments. So we have suddenly a very powerful political presence of very questionable characters, and that's quite a, a shock. Um, so, um, what I'm going to try to do is to say, uh, is to propose an explanation for all of this happening in so many different places. And I think the um, the historical opening, the the opening um, for this mainstreaming of right wing extremism and right wing populism, um, came. Um, with the failure of political parties, of, move, of social movements, interest groups, intellectuals, to force governments in the industrialized world, in the developed world, to socially regulate processes of globalization. Economic, the economic process of globalization, the political process of globalization, and the cultural process of globalization, cultural modernization as well. And um, uh, th these processes of the, the recent wave of economic globalization began in the late 60s or 70s together with processes of cultural modernization. And the opportunity to regulate them wasn't immediately there because that was, if you remember, the 70s were a time of a very severe economic crisis. Now the opportunity came in the late 90s, mid 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, when there were center-left governments in quite a few key countries. Um, but that opportunity uh, was, was lost. It was not, um, it was missed uh, um, because, uh, and this was mentioned uh, uh, um, uh, also, as mentioned yet, uh, already, it was, it was missed because of neoliberalism. It was missed because uh, um, an ideology that was part of um, the reaction, intellectual, political reaction to the, the crisis of the 1970s was so powerful that it dominated the political thought even of center-left parties. 
And so um, the belief that market solutions, market-based solutions, deregulation, privatization, liberalization, were, were best, the best solutions in any case was so powerful, even in center-left parties, that the, the political opportunity to actually regulate these processes of globalization and, 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 and cultural change were, were, were missed. Um, and the problem, of course, oh, and, and very importantly, there was a, in, in addition to neoliberalism, there was a, um, a very interesting political theory that added to uh, the, the, the quality of, of, of neoliberalism. That was the thought that um, trade, global trade, would lead to um, political liberalization by way of creating a middle class that then would demand political freedoms. So the idea was, with trade, we bring democracy to Eastern Europe, to China, to Russia. You can see how, that, how well that worked out. Um, but th so there was the neoliberal idea of market-based solutions, as well as a political theory of, with free trade, we will bring democracy and peace, because if we trade, we, we will not lead war against each other. Now, the problem, of course, was that the economic theory behind trade, that the benefits of trade, of globalization, are so big that the economic losers of globalization, the people that might lose their jobs in the factories, those that in the 50s, 60s, 70s were able to have middle class lives based on very little uh, a formal training, that, that those can be compensated, retraining and benefits and so on and so forth. Now that compensation didn't happen, and it's from a political science perspective, it's quite obvious why it didn't happen, because those economic losers were at the same time the political losers, because they had to try to prevent these processes, had to had try to regulate them, and in the face of neoliberalism, had not been politically successful. Now these people were economic losers, they were not compensated, quite worse, because of neoliberalism, at the same time, there was reduction of taxes for the rich and cuts of the welfare state. And on top of that, an incredible amount of condescension. And that goes for all the countries that we talk about. Basically, the message is, if you can't make it in this new, modern, global world, if you're not fit for globalization, Pay better attention in school, right? Or your children need to pay better attention in school. So it was this, this combination. And that created a, an economic race to the bottom, more competition. And at the same time, for the, for the people that were affected, these factory workers, people that had good jobs, middle class lives, and suddenly their lives were threatened and the lives of their children were threatened, also a cultural problem because they were dealing, of course, also with the cultural change, the changing role of women, feminism, the, change, the acceptance of homosexuality, all these changes, all of that happens at the same time. And in democracies, and that's my point, the people can defend themselves. They can revolt against those elites that brought them these changes and didn't protect them against these changes, against this competition. And unfortunately for immigrants, immigrants are the face, the, the most visible face of, of this competition, economic competition as well as cultural competition, cultural change. Suddenly the composition of the, of the population changes. So here you have a process of several decades that leads in, again, very different national specific ways, and I can talk about that, how that works out in all the different countries, that leads to a revolt against the elites, and that includes the center-left elites. The center-left parties deserted, abandoned a large part of their traditional constituency. They didn't do anything for them, they didn't protect them, and they, paying, they are paying the price now and so you have a shift of wor the working class vote, if you want to call it that, from 
the center left to the far right. And um, in different ways, um, this results in this uh, mainstreaming of right-wing extremist positions because under the guise of all these various parties, you have questionable characters who come into power with them. Thank you. How can we reach a turnaround? I mean, how can we get right-wing extremism out of the mainstream again? Well, if this is on. It, it's a great question. It's obviously the problem that we're facing right this moment. Um, you know, in this case, I think country by country is a, a little bit different. Um, in the United States, we, of course, have a very vibrant civil society. It is not connected to the government. It doesn't get money from the government, right? These are entities that stand on their own. And what has happened in the reaction to, um, to Trump is that people have simply taken to the streets. And there have been, you know, the women's movement, the, the March for Black Lives. There's been stuff about shooting in the United States. There's been a huge outpouring of resources to uh, organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Anti-Defamation League, the ACLU, et cetera, as, as in what's kind of all broadly under the basis of what's called the resistance. So there is a civil society reaction to this shift. Um, in some ways, I think Trump's movement is represents in a way kind of like what you have in European countries where you have maybe 20 to 30 percent of the population that is attracted to right-wing populist movements. In other words, he ran in an election in which he took down, I don't remember, he had 16 competitors in the primaries, right? So a large part of the Republican base was split between these folks. Trump rose to the top through that process. I don't think he represents a majority of Americans by a long shot. So the battle in the United States is going to be whether this quote unquote resistance and the 50% frankly of people who do not vote in US elections. So this isn't about voter suppression. These aren't about rules to keep black and brown people from the polls. These are people who just don't go, right? There, when you take polls of the United States and where people fall on issues, they don't fall in the Trump camp by majorities. They tend to be more liberal on things like LGBT rights and, and other issues. If those people turn out to vote, this will change. That, that, that's, I mean, it's pretty much going to be down to the ballot box if you, want to, if you want to change this dynamic. That will not erase the kinds of problems that Thomas was talking about. We still have horrible economic dislocation. We know analyses um, of why somebody switched. There was quite a share of people who went from being an Obama voter to a Trump voter had to do with status anxiety, fear of loss of sort of power, that for their children. And those things are going to still exist. But if the other 50% of the voting public came out, which could end up with is a pretty good Democratic wave and a rump right-wing populist movement, Trumpism, essentially. But I mean, that's what it's going to take in, uh, in this context, I think. Thank you. Um, Rafael, in Poland, there are also civil society reactions, and you already mentioned uh, some of them. However, civil society is very much under pressure, um, particularly right now, uh, under the right-wing government. So how do you see the, the, the possibilities in Poland um, with regard to my question? Well, right, that is a difficult one. Um, I wish I knew the answer. I mean, we are definitely thinking about it. Uh, what would be the perfect answer to this situation? I don't think anybody has found the, 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 the perfect answer yet. Uh, but yes, Poland does have a civil society uh, in, a, in a broad sense of the term. Um, and I think, in a way, the solution is is is, is to be found uh, uh, just uh, uh, just there. And I think, you know, whether or not you you you, you accept the Gramsci theory of cultural hegemony, uh, I I think uh, in 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 a, in a way the solution is really to be found in in the field of culture. And I'm talking about the long-term solutions uh, that, that that go beyond electoral cycles. Um, unfortunately, today we are very much on the defensive, and I, I, I admit it, and not just because of what the currently um, ruling party does uh, in, in government, but I am afraid the, uh, the problem is also much deeper. And to give you, uh, to, to give you an example, the ONR, the, the extreme right, 
fascist group I, I mentioned already that organizes the 11th of, of November marches. It is especially popular among the young people, which is probably one of the single biggest challenges we are facing. There is a, an opinion poll uh, uh, with, with some shocking results uh, conducted by a, a respected um, um, uh, polling organization uh, that asked people, do you support organizations, groups such as the ONR? And the highest support uh, for um, um, for those groups uh, um, uh, was among uh, respondents aged between 18 and 24, and it was 38 percent. Not the majority, but a very significant uh, minority, almost 40 percent, which means that the challenge uh, will be with us for many years, <coughs> probably decades decades to come. But uh, again, I think especially in, in, in that context, it means that we need to, to look for longer term solutions uh, uh, in, in, you know, in those contexts where socialization happens and it has repercussions for, for years and decades. Uh, so that is popular culture, uh, that is um, the sports culture, uh, that is the internet, of course, and you know many, 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 many other fields beyond the parliamentary politics and, and beyond daily responses to, to, to government policies. Thank you, um, Thomas. What do you think, in particular, with regard to centre-left parties and social democracy? Um, with regard to the phenomenon you described, what should be what, what is the best answer, um, also taking into consideration that there are right-wing populist actors giving uh, easy answers to, to difficult questions. So what possibilities do we have? Well, I, I, wish, I wish I could um, <coughs> give uh, um, an easy answer, but there is none, um, as Rafael has also pointed out. But I would also go with uh, Gamshi. Um, um, but uh, not forgetting that uh, Gramsci was a materialist at, at heart, so uh, people highlight the cultural hege hegemony, um, but um, it, it all revolves around better policies, better, better policies to protect people from, if we want to keep market economies that are liberal democracies, pluralist societies, if, if that's what we want to keep, we cannot have nationalism interfere with that because nationalism, protectionism will eventually destroy this. And uh, that, that, that is just the reality of how the dynamic works. So we need better policies. And following up on what Heidi said, I mean, you're not going to be surprised that I think that working at the national level will not suffice. Um, in order to keep what I call the race to the bottom from happening, like uh, um, a uh, competitive tax uh, uh, tax war, like lowering taxes, lowering taxes, lowering taxes, just to attract investment. Um, if if we don't have policies, if we don't have rules to prevent that, then that race to the bottom will continue, and it will make it more difficult to have the kinds of welfare state protections that help people fend um, uh, of uh, the, the competitive pressure, and I would argue that doesn't automatically, I'm not an economic determinist, um, that will not automatically take away racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism. But I, my argument would be it will be much easier for people to adapt to change if they, if they are not fundamentally threatened by economic change in economic pressure. It will make it more easy for people, and it will make it easier for center-left parties, for NGOs, uh, social movement intellectuals, to um, talk about the acceptance of cultural change, to sell uh, people on cultural change. Because sometimes people are just afraid of what they don't know, and they, they just need to find out that they don't really need to be scared of this or that cultural change. But that is all made easier if there are policies in place that check the, the economic competition at the global level, 
or from a European perspective, I would already be happy if we had something like that at the European level. And of course, with national policies that, that help protect people's livelihoods. Uh, uh, there has not been a lot of empathy with the plight of the refugees in, in Polish society in, in, in recent years. And the way this European crisis was framed in political discourse uh, and in media uh, created uh, anxiety in Poland, an anxiety around um, identity, I suppose. Um, and that was exploited very skillfully by the political right. And the European refugee crisis coincided with the Polish electoral campaign. And despite not being in any direct way connected to the Polish situation, it actually became one of the main topics of the campaign, framed uh, um, through, uh, through xenophobic discourse. Um, so you don't really need uh, a big group of Muslims in order uh, for the Islamophobic propaganda to be uh, successful. That is, that is an example. Uh, but I, I would say anti-Semitism uh, is similar in the sense that it does not require a big Jewish community for the anti-Semites to, um, um, to hate the Jews. And th this phrase is not, uh, is not new in Poland, anti-Semitism without Jews. The Jewish community in Poland today, it exists, but it is very, very small, uh, uh, especially in, in contrast with the, with the history of the, of, the, um, of the very large Jewish community in Poland uh, uh, before World War II. Today, it is maybe 10,000 people in the, in, the, in the whole country of almost 40 million. Um, but anti-Semitism is the traditional language of xenophobia in Poland. Uh, in other, uh, or, 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 or maybe even more than that, it is also the traditional language of hostility to liberal democracy. Um, so I would say that a lot of the general um, 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 hostility towards democracy as such is expressed through anti-Semitic language, which I think partly explains why we have seen this explosion of anti-Semitic discourse in, uh, in Poland recently, I think it is very strongly related to a more general crisis of, of democratic values in, in Poland on many different levels. Yes, I would um, like to add something to that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not an expert on Poland by any means, but um, from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, Polish experience as um, uh, an experience of, uh, this was a term used earlier in the workshop, disruptive transformation. Um, after um, uh, the, uh, the Eastern Bloc fell apart and Poland was added to the European Union. That was the disruptive transformation. Now the problem, of course, was that um, all across Poland, like in East Germany, like in Hungary, like in the Czechoslovakia and then Czech Republic and Slovakia, a lot of um, um, enterprises, companies were no longer competitive. So many, many people lost their jobs. Many, many people had to go through this transformation in a, in a situation of incredible insecurity. And at the same time, they were winners of this process. Um, in Russia, you talk about the oligarchs. Now, there are equivalents uh, in those places. And there were people, I think here you call them carpetbaggers, right? People coming from the West to exploit the situation because they have the know-how to deal with the capitalist economy, the market-based economy. People in Poland had no experience with this kind of economy. So in that context, you have, once again, center-left parties, but also center-right parties, who did not help the people that needed the most help. And they are getting their revenge now. Because it, the, the policies of the Polish government, of the Hungarian government, of these, they're not just about anti-Semitism and xenophobia. They also have social policies 
you know, I, I, again, I'm not an expert, so you have to look at all of it, but we heard from about Hungary that an offer of a, of a, a food voucher of 40 euros, that is already attractive for people. A little bit like the American equivalent, a tax cut that overwhelmingly goes to the rich people, can be sold to the majority of people who will suffer from the cuts that are, that are going to follow the tax cuts just because they also get $20. It makes no sense, but this is what happens in politics. People are getting their revenge, is what I would argue. Well, actually what two of you just said about the, the economic, socio-economic background to, to the crisis of democracy, I think that was very true 10, 15 years ago. Um, but I think for, 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 for the Polish situation today, something else is, 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 is actually at play. Uh, and, and I think it is actually... Uh, more important today for us to look at the anxiety around around uh, um, ideology and identity than than the social economic aspects. Why? Because uh, well, paradoxically, um, for 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 the for, for for the last ten years, Poland has been doing well economically. Surprisingly, it was actually the only country in the whole of Europe that didn't have a recession through all those years, even during the global crisis. Uh, Poland was, well, you might say, was relatively lucky, uh, 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 but I don't believe it is it is the the the, the economic hardship that is directly uh, um, at the, you know at the root of the of of, of the of, of of the crisis of of democratic values, uh, especially among among the young people today. Um, uh, but I, I, I definitely agree with, with, with your remark about the changing perception of history and, and the collapse of what you might call the, the anti-fascist uh, uh, um, consensus. And this is something that is very topical for Poland, uh, for, for, for Poland today. And just this year, almost all of the political debate is around, uh, is around history and World War II, and what happened during the war, and immediately after the war, and who was right, who was wrong. Um, um, uh, and I am sorry to say the, 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 the revisionist view, of, of the, the far-right revisionist view of, um, of Polish history is, is, is currently more and more mainstream. It is sanctioned by the Institute of National Memory, which is, uh, which is a state-sponsored institution that we also referred to as the Ministry of Truth, uh, but it is presiding over this revision uh, of history uh, on the official level, and monuments are are, are removed to the anti-Nazi uh, resistance in Poland this year. Uh, street names are changed. Uh, uh, you're no longer allowed to uh, refer to 1945 as liberation. The streets with that name are changed in Poland today. Uh, it turns out that some of the right-wing figures think Poland was actually on the wrong side of World War II. It should have been allied with Germany against the Soviet Union. Um, and I think just 10, 15, not to mention 20 years ago, such views were not heard, or if they were expressed, it was just a Political margin that uh, that shared them, and today they they are they, you know they, they are almost official. They are more or less official. They are very mainstream, and I think this is this is uh, a very very important part of the of the Polish challenge. But I think something similar has been happening in in other countries in in, in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so it is not just the Polish case; it is a much broader. Um, broader ch challenge when, when talking about history. Uh, but it's not just about history, of course. It is about the contemporary perception of national identity. Um, so, yeah, there, uh, there's a crucial difference. Um, there is no ministry of truth yet in Germany. But uh, we just renamed the ministry of the interior, minister, ministry of the interior and Heimat, 
<laughs> and uh, that is a very kind of German term to describe. Uh, uh, about, yeah, the, but it's not. It's it's more romantic than homeland. So um, I think homeland is a is a is a way to, to co copy this. And Heimat to rename that ministry uh, uh, Heimat is a is a is a is one of the many ways some establishment politicians are trying to outdo the populists. But catering to to that, uh, there are several examples of that. Um, but I think, um, um, in general, when you look at how people feel about things, what their positions are, you have um, opinion polls that sh have shown for a long time that there is a residual um, mass of of anti-Semitism, xenophobia. That that it changes, but it is um, it, it's not a sudden. Um, Change in recent times, so you you have a um, you have a, a base for for this. Now, in the current context, it becomes more ex it becomes more acceptable to act accordingly, to speak accordingly. So that has changed. Um, I would agree with that. But is it a complete crumbling of this anti-fascist um, consensus, as you called it? I'm not so sure, but. An additional distinction needs to be made in Germany, and that's between the West and the East. Because that anti-fascist consensus in the West uh, was hard work. Um, it took until the late 60s for people to start asking questions and then to change the discourse and change society. Now that never happened in the East. It didn't have to happen from the government's perspective, uh, well, the government's perspective was the same in West Germany, but for different reasons. But in the East, the, for the, from the East German Socialist Republic understanding, that was the anti-fascist German state. So they, they had kind of made anti-fascism the official ideology, which spared them to actually deal with it and figure it out. So that is one explanation um, for the differences between the East and the West. Germany, um, even though we, we have refugees in Germany, um, anti-migrant attitudes are more widespread in regions without migrants. And um, the xenophobia is higher um, in places without any, you know, cultural diversity. So it's exactly the other way around, that, that the lack of cultural diversity and the lack of experience with um, migrants, Muslims, Jews, you know, you, you mentioned anti-Semitism without Jews. It's, it's always the same story. Sorry, then I was clear, but that was what I was alluding to, that we have the same experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say that's also true broadly in the U.S. context, the same phenomenon. Same here, yeah, same in Poland. Uh, but I wanted to add something, one or two sentences. Uh, um, yes, so uh, um, anti-Semitism without Jews is not new in Poland. Islamophobia without Muslims is new. Um, uh, um, in a way, it is probably easier to hate a group that you don't know, uh, never had contact with, you only have the stereotype. Uh, um, on the other hand, I am afraid uh, having contact uh, um, with, with, with a diverse society uh, is, is, is not automatically a recipe. And this is what we have seen in the, in, the, in the case of the Polish community in the UK, for example. And you might think that you know, people who come from Poland as a mono-ethnic country who are confronted with, with a multicultural society, they open up and they, they, they become more open-minded, more tolerant. Uh, that is, I, I'm afraid, not, not, not the case. And we have a mountain of evidence uh, from the last couple of years from the UK, from the Polish community, uh, including people who go back to Poland, who actually become more xenophobic or, or intolerant, or in fact racist, uh, uh, than before. Um, and apparently the confrontation with, with a multicultural society in, in, in those cases 
activate some prejudice that they probably had previously, but they never really thought about that. Uh, and, and suddenly they were confronted with a situation uh, uh, that, was, that was challenging, that was confusing, and they could make sense of it through activating stereotypes uh, and, and thinking about their environment in, in, in a stereotypical or, or, racist, uh, or racist terms. They go back to Poland and they say, well, we must defend Poland from becoming multicultural like Britain. And that is an argument that is, that is heard a, a lot, which is, which is sad, really. Uh, but I think it all depends on what is the context of the intercultural um, interaction and, and how that is framed and facilitated, uh, because intercultural contact in itself does not guarantee um, a more tolerant society, it seems. Well, I think quite a few organizations are facing that because they got a bit of a Donald Trump windfall. SPLC certainly did. Uh, ACLU did. You can read that in the press. And I, the big, I mean, I'll just say in the case of the Southern Poverty Law Center, the big question becomes, is this a new normal? In other words, are we going to have to fight civil rights battles in a way that we didn't in the past? Uh, meaning we have to have a much more sustained effort on every level for the kinds of programming that we do where we are. And I know a lot of other organizations are facing that same question. Or is this something that's going to reverse itself and result in kind of a rump racist group of people in the GOP, largely in the South? I don't think we know the answer to that. So at least in our case, we've been investing in particular in programs to deal with the assault on immigrants. So we're now representing or attempting to represent every single person detained in southern uh, detention camps for immigrants, right? So trying to deal with that. We're suing ICE. We're suing the Justice Department. We're, you know, we've signed on to one of the, the suits about the Muslim ban, for example. We've done heavy reporting on things like hate crimes and domestic terrorism and a lot of work just calling attention to how much racism there is now in the... Uh, that the administration is injecting into the mainstream. So, you know, we have invested to be able to have more capacity to do that, but we, you know, we can only see so much about what the future sort of brings and how that long, long that needs to be sustained. I don't think anybody who's gotten a Trump windfall doesn't think that if there was a big reversal in electoral fortunes for the Republicans in November that the windfall would disappear. It, it would, right? Because people would feel that the ballot box had solved the problem that they're looking to other institutions to solve right now. Um, so it's, you know, we, we will have to wait and see. I mean, if that doesn't happen in November and we're looking at the world like we're facing perhaps at the end of the day eight years of Donald Trump, well, that tells you the direction you have to invest your resources because it's really going to be up to state and local governments, uh, civil society institutions and whatnot to try to salvage the gains that were made from the mid-1960s, right, on that front and to try to sort of set, try to bring us back to norms about issues like racism, xenophobia, nativism, anti-Semitism, you know, but I, I think there's, you know, you, can, you can't quite tell what, which way the tea leaves are going to show right now. Uh, and it's a big challenge. Hey, well, you know, I spoke at the Global Forum on Combating Antisemitism in Jerusalem, um, and there was a Polish official in the audience who really didn't like what I what I said, and I I, I, I became the the subject of a national discussion as a traitor of my country. I don't know whether there is somebody from the Polish embassy here <laughs> hiding um, under under the table and uh, the, the, the situation will be repeated. No, but uh, seriously, uh, no, no, I, I think it was Andrei Sakharov, the, 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 the famous Soviet dissident, who once said, I, I think very wisely, my country needs support, but it also needs pressure. And, 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 and I, I think this is a, um, uh, this is a motto that really, uh, uh, that really makes a lot of sense in, in, in the case of uh, a serious challenge to, to, to democracy uh, that we are experiencing uh, in, 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 in countries such as Poland, Hungary, and, and others. Um, 
what form this positive pressure takes is is, is another matter. Uh, uh, but I think you know this value uh, I, I I referred to previously. Uh, solidarity is, is is very important, meaning international solidarity with you know, with the progressive forces in in each in each of those countries. Uh, and you know, personally, I I, I think I, I really felt uh, this uh, this sense of desperation uh, since since January this year when when this wave of antisemitism happened and and the feeling of helplessness. Is terrible, mm -hmm. and I think it, it can only be overcome through through international solidarity.